Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. We're here with David Garrow, who is a historian and a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Um, David, good to see you. We're talking about your 2017 biography, Rising Star, The Making of Barack Obama, which has gotten a burst of fresh attention again. I want to first let's remind people about the genesis of why you wrote this book and the reception that it had. Um, it was very much counterintuitive to a lot of what was being written at the time. I was very uh, intrigued when Obama first came on the, the national stage in, in early 2008, winning the Iowa caucuses. Um, and the first thing I did was was get a, a paperback copy of his uh, you know memoir, Dreams from My Father. Um, and reading that, um, for me as a historian, it was very clear that, that this was not uh, historical storytelling, that this was, you know, memoir as fiction with, you know, pseudonyms for most of the people, composite ca characters. Um, and so I was very curious about the real story of Obama's three uh, community organizing years on the far south side of Chicago, 1985 mm -hmm. to 1988. Um, and so after doing about a year's worth of reading. Um, in the spring of 2009, I, I went to Chicago to, to meet both the, the white guys who'd been his mentors um, and all the, the black people down on the far south side who had been in, in the community organization that, that Barack staffed. Um, my first intent uh, originally was just to perhaps do some long magazine piece. Um, but then within the course of about a year, it became clear that it was worth doing uh, a comprehensive book that would also cover Obama's years in Illinois politics, uh, which had not been, been thoroughly researched either. Um, mm -hmm. Even then, looking back on the uh, campaign coverage in 2007, 2008, it was very striking to me how uh, incurious uh, much of the journalism was. Uh, that they were sort of taking the Obama campaign handouts um, and going to uh, interview people who were recommended uh, by Obama's staff. Well, let me just ask, cut, uh, you know, stop there for a second, because there has been this sense of a very partisan divide within the media, which also implies there is a there is a certain portion of the media that's been very much critical of Obama, including at the time when your book came out. I want to. You know, now that we've had six plus years pass, how do you feel? Do you feel there's been um, a revisionist view of Obama? Do you feel that what motivated you to do the book continues today? This sort of incurious um, halo, whatever you would call it, around the Obamas. There was so much hostility towards Barack when he was president from the far right, um, yeah. in particular. Or the the birtherism uh, problem, uh, which the Obama people should have taken more seriously than they did. I mean, it's it's understandable that they thought it was a crock, uh, but it it came to have a, a very large footprint. Um, though there's you know absolutely no question he was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. Period. Mm -hmm. um, I think as the years have gone by. Um, after what um, I think everyone realized was an underwhelming presidency compared to the outsized, really impossible expectations uh, that existed when he, he first won election in, in November of 2008. Um, I think as the years have gone by, uh, people are more able to acknowledge uh, the real shortcomings of the Obama presidency, particularly in foreign policy. Um, the war in Ukraine has highlighted that, um, how back in 2014, uh, the Obama administration didn't react very strongly uh, when the Putin dictatorship seized Crimea um, and then invaded the, the eastern Donbass. Um, similarly, with Obama's failure to respond uh, to the use of chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, another a very serious blot. Well, one thing that is, you know, a lot of people attribute the his, the challenges of his years to political deadlock in Washington. You think that the president of the United States actually has a lot more 
um, agency, I guess, would be the word to really make an impact despite deadlock. So let's, let's correct that perception in your research. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the most important things about Barack's early years in politics in the Illinois State Senate down in Springfield is how successfully he worked with conservative Republicans, uh, mm -hmm. Republicans more conservative than a Mitch McConnell. Um, he was a very outgoing figure um, in the Illinois State Senate. Uh, made friends across the aisle, socialized with people, you know, drink beer, play cards, um, and building those relationships in Springfield were what enabled him to be so successful in Illinois politics. Now, as president, does he make that sort of outreach to Republicans in Congress? No. Um, to me, that's uh, not just disappointing, but uh, uh, puzzling. How do you forget uh, or, or discard uh, something that had been uh, one of the most successful parts uh, of your repertoire. I think what makes this so relevant today, and let, let me go back to that first question of, so if you were to characterize Obama in terms of being a success, a failure, middling, especially in comparison to the two presidents that followed, where do you think he will rank in history? Um. I would I would divide it into two pieces. Um, Barack and and Michelle and the family uh, were an absolutely classy presence in the White House. Mm -hmm. I think they made even those of us who can be quite critical of his record uh, proud of of what they represented as a presidential family, uh, and and that contrasts both with the present day Biden family and with with uh, Donald Trump, um, but. Um, I'm somewhat to the left of, of Barack on, on many issues, um, and so I don't find the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, to be something to brag about. I, I view it as a you know humongous financial gift to the, to the for-profit health insurance industry. Um, but then I lived in Britain for a good number of years and have seen what a real uh, national health service, uh, universal insurance system, uh, feels like. You know, one of the things that um, you've chronicled is the relationship with Biden and the fact, or, or you know, that he did not allegedly want him to run. Talk a bit about that and how you think that may be framing where we are today. Again, I know there's a whole other conversation about Hunter Biden, Donald Trump, but the relationship between Barack Obama and Joe Biden. What did you discover and how do you think that's playing out? Uh, the, the very first time I went to the White House to, to see Barack for the first time, uh, waiting there just outside the Oval, uh, who comes up uh, to introduce himself to me but Joe Biden. Uh, I, I don't think by accident. Um, but Biden was an excellent vice president, uh, very loyal, uh, very close to Barack, uh, mm -hmm. clearly gave Barack lots of advice uh, and, and not of uh, talking out of turn, telling others what he was up to. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, and this is not something I know, this is just what I perceive. Um, I think by 2015, 2016, uh, Obama realized that Joe Biden wasn't getting any younger. Um, and, you know, on the merits, um, there's no question that Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, was and is qualified to be president of the United States. Um, now, clearly, Biden uh, was hurt by that, though he, he did a superb job of, of not, you know, dramatizing that in, in public. Um, David Samuels, who interviewed me for Tablet, as you noted earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Samuels believes very strongly, this is his belief, not mine, I do not know it, um, that Obama in D.C. has continued to be a, a very important uh, behind the scenes, uh, counselor, advisor, uh, Samuels might put a little more strongly than that, uh, throughout the Biden administration to date. Uh, you don't believe that or you have no evidence of that? I don't perceive evidence of that. I mean, from, from what I know, the Obamas have been spending most of their time on Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, not in, not in D.C., uh, granted, uh, the percentage of Biden administration officials who are Obama veterans 
uh, is is astonishingly high. Um, so those relationships, of course, continue. Um, but uh, I draw back from any notion that, that Obama is uh, some, you know, behind the curtain uh, political ventriloquist. Now, David, one of the things that's interesting, your book, I think, fair to characterize is quite a critical book of Barack Obama, if you think that's a fair assessment. And there's been a tendency for us to weaponize content for both sides. You know, how how do you feel that as, as a historian, you've won a Pulitzer for your work, and yet you too come under attack when something like this has come out? Is this, I'm curious about your experience in the media, because what I'm looking at sort of who gravitates towards you, are you happy with the people who are calling you up? Maybe including myself. Um, I mean, I, I think I can say uh, for the record that uh, you know, last week I turned down both Sean Hannity and uh, uh, you know, Glenn Beck, Lou Dobbs. Um, I mean, my very strong preference is is to do you know nonpartisan uh, professional people, uh, not folks who have a, a an explicitly uh, hostile agenda. Um, and that's the distinction I'd make. I, I, I think as a scholar, um, you can and, and should be critical, um, but you're not supposed to be hostile. Um, mm-hmm. You're supposed to have you know, some measure of empathy. I, I, and I purposely say empathy rather than sympathy. Um, but this is not a new challenge for me. Um, mm-hmm. uh, one of my earlier books is, is The Standard History of Roe v. Wade. Um, I'm extremely pro-choice. Um, yet back uh, 18 years ago now, um, I wrote a very critical uh, legal uh, magazine article uh, about Harry Blackman, uh, you know, yep. the, the father of Roe v. Wade. But in Blackman's uh, later years on the court, um, his clerks really, you know, took over the business. Um, you know, not only were they writing the opinions, uh, you know, chapter and verse, uh, but they were engaging in, in very negative comments about other justices, uh, sort of behavior that should not well, be taking. Your articles, you've written, a, obviously, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning book, but you've about Martin Luther King Jr. and even some of the information that came out about um, Dr. King's, you know, allegedly standing by in the midst of sexual assault. Forgive me if I've mischaracterized that, but, um, you know, it seems so germane because we're in a period right now where we have two candidates who are, or two leading candidates, I should say, who are the gifts that keep on giving when it comes to controversial news. And so from where you sit, first of all, are, are you interested in looking at either of those two presidents as your next? Oh, no, no. no you I, seem quite no. vigorously no on that. Why is that? Yeah. Um, Rising Star took me essentially, you know, eight plus years. Um, I did over a thousand interviews. Granted, you know, at least half of those were on the phone. Uh, yep. But that's a lot of travel, and it's very draining in terms of energy and, and emotion. Um, I'm over seventy. I no, I'm, I'm not going to do uh, uh, Donald Trump or, or uh, Joe Biden. Uh, back after I did my big uh, Martin Luther King book, Bearing the Cross, in, in the 80s, mm-hmm. uh, I briefly thought about doing a, a comprehensive book on, on the J. Edgar Hoover FBI uh, before realizing that former FBI agents uh, often are not the sort of people you want to spend quality time with. Um, and so I pulled back from that and, and went on to, to do the, the big book on, on Roe, Liberty and Sexuality. Um, Doing doing books that last that, that we're still talking about, you know, thirty five years later, um, take a lot out of you. Well, let's talk about that. You've you've done thousands of interviews r- related to the civil rights movement. Um, what is the state of the movement today, as as an informed and observer? I mean, certainly we've had people like Reverend Jesse Jackson, you know, having left. Was it the Rainbow Push and such? I mean. Who are the leaders that should be on our radar, or are there any? I don't. I don't think of it as a movement today. Quite honestly. Okay. Once you know, once we got past 
uh, the era in which black people were largely excluded from public office across most of the country, much of the country, um, you know, we've transitioned to a, an era um, where there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds, um, you know, thousands, if you go down to the, you know, city county level of, of black elected officials. Um, and that's how it should be. Um, you know, someone like Hakeem Jeffries as the Democratic leader in, in the House of Representatives. Um, you know, he's responsible both to a constituency in Brooklyn um, and to all his con colleagues uh, across the, uh, the Democratic membership of the House. Um, that's a whole lot, um, you know, better grounded in, in real representation uh, than being, say, Al Sharpton. What about Donald Trump? Because we've certainly seen a rise in a rise. in rhetoric. rhetoric. Um, arguably, some people feel that Barack Obama planted the seeds, you know, for the success of Donald Trump. Um, let's start there. You know, what what's your view of Trump view as of a historian? Trump. I know you have not interviewed thousands of people, but I'd call you an informed observer. Uh, I'm, I'm exceptionally negative about Donald Trump, the person, Donald Trump, the president. Yet, at the same time, uh, we should acknowledge um, that there were some very successful aspects to the Trump presidency. Um, much more so than Obama, uh, the Trump administration r recognized China, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, as a major growing uh, threat to the United States. Um, that's another foreign policy uh, dimension on which the Obama administration uh, largely dropped the ball. Uh, similarly, with these Abraham Accords uh, that some Trump officials uh, arranged in the Middle East uh, to get increasing acceptance of Israel um, by Arab countries, mm -hmm. um, a major historical accomplishment. Now. Much of that was done by successive secretaries of state, by Trump's son-in-law. Um, and and leaders know. evolve, of course. You know, Xi Jinping and his grasp on power certainly became more solidified during the Trump administration. What about Joe Biden? Um, and, and again, there you, you could see there are these very strong ties back to Barack Obama. I don't know um, what you think about his presidency and if you've seen a continued influence of the Obamas. Um, I've been very surprised that, that Biden has uh, become such a just simple, partisan voice. Um, mm -hmm. That's not what he was for decades as a senator. He was a very good senator. I mean, people joked that he talked too much in the Judiciary Committee, talked too much in the uh, you know, Foreign Relations Committee. Um, but Biden was, was a first-rate senator. I mean, very active, very involved. Um, but, you know, uh, perhaps in, in reaction to the Trump years, um, this has turned into a, a just insistently partisan presidency, um, and that's not good for, for America. Well, people talk about the age of Obama, age of the Obama. age of Trump. What age do you think we're entering now from what you see? Uh, I think for, you know, six or more years now, we have been in an era of uh, such incredible uh, domestic political division, uh, which is, as you noted earlier, is now increasingly mirrored in, in journalism, um, I think that's extremely dangerous to the United States. Um, it's made me, and I'm a former member of DSA, Democratic Socialist, yeah. it's, it's made me become anti-partisan in my feelings about politics. Um, I'll give you a, a very uh, surprising example. Uh, former Nebraska Senator Ben Sass uh, mm -hmm. left the sadly uh, to become president of the University of Florida. I, mean, I don't agree with much on Ben Sass. Uh, agree with Ben Sass on much, but he was an excellent senator, super bright guy, and he stressed that while he was extremely conservative, he was not at all partisan. Um, and that's what we need more of is people who, irrespective of their ideologies, uh, are, are as unpartisan uh, as they can be. And yet we seem to punish, I think of Mitt Romney taking a stance against Donald Trump. That did not bode well for him politically. Correct. Um, and that's true in both parties. I mean, there are Democratic members of the House 
Um, Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey is a, a favorite example to me. Um, there are um, some successful members of Congress, and you know Romney's still there, uh, at least this year. Yeah. Um, and 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 we should embrace uh, whether it's a, a, a God, you know, whether it's a, a Gottheimer or, or Romney uh, or someone like Susan Collins or Lisa Murkowski. Um, more, you know, we, we see this in the polling. Um, you know, there's a, a very large percentage of Americans uh, who want something in the middle. You know, what's interesting is that for many candidates, citing Donald Trump being close to Donald Trump is seen as a real asset continuing to this day, I, you don't seem to see the same desire to be close to Barack Obama, to kind of use him, tap him for the campaign trail. I certainly understand that Biden, he may have wanted to distance himself. Is that an accurate reflection, do you think? And if so, why? I think so. But I think it's a reflection, too, that, that Barack has, you know, pretty much largely disappeared from visible politics. Um, you know, they, you know, have chosen to go this route of, you know, living on Martha's Vineyard and hanging out with, you know, celebrities and billionaires. Um, Not my, a good look my, for the Democrats, I guess. No, my, my historian colleague, Kai Bird, who's been in the news a lot lately, co-author mm -hmm. of the uh, Oppenheimer book that the film is based on. Um, Kai emphasized to me back six years ago when Rising Star came out, you know, that Barack had the option of, of going the Jimmy Carter route. Um, you know, another underwhelming, yeah. unsuccessful presidency, but a post-presidency that, that just superb. Um, yeah. um, and, and, you know, Barack could have made that choice uh, rather than the billionaire route. And so it's unfair to be seeing the Obamas as sort of an invisible power because they also stayed in Washington as well, which does is unusual for former presidents. Do you think that's an unfair criticism? that they're still exerting influence? No. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that the Clintons, of course, exerted influence, um, you know, after, uh, you know, 1999. Um, you know, no, no harm there. Um, uh, I, I think that's, you know, but, but to me, Barack's relative disappearance is similar to, say, the disappearance of George W. Bush. Um, yeah. We don't see reference made to, to former President Bush anymore either. You know, I, I, I want to get back to basically where we are today and what's on your radar and talk a little bit about Michelle Obama, because she's become in some ways this cultural phenomenon, wrote her own book. Were you surprised by that or have you been surprised? I've been very surprised that Michelle uh, has bought in to this culture of hanging out with celebrities. Uh, uh, lots of black people in Chicago who knew the Obamas back before 2004, whom I interviewed. Um, and I'm interviewing them in, you know, 2011, 2012, yeah. the presidencies, you know, about halfway in. Um, and they could see even then the sort of transformation in the Obamas. Um, and these people, you know, who knew them when, you know, they lived in this, you know, modest condo in, in Hyde Park, they weren't surprised that Barack uh, was going the Jay-Z, Beyonce route. But they were astonished and, and deeply saddened that Michelle uh, was, was doing that because they, they rightly viewed Michelle as, as just the ultimate classy product uh, of working class, uh, black, you know, South Side, Black Chicago. Why? Why would it be unfortunate? Yeah, because hanging out with stars like, you know, Oprah, Jay Z, can also be a way to exert incredible influence in areas that you care about. I just want to right size why it's a bad thing to hang out with stars. To me, and I, I think I'm I'm being fair in saying that this is what a lot of uh, the older African American community in Chicago uh, felt when I was speaking with them uh, that this betrays some some need, uh, some perhaps insecurity. Uh, you know, again, I go back to the Jimmy Carter comparison. Um, I, I 
had some contact with, with President Carter when I was living in Atlanta 20 plus years ago. Um, Jimmy Carter didn't need to do that. Jimmy Carter was building homes, you know, with Habitat for Humanity. Um, so I, you know, for better or worse, I think those choices do give us a, a sort of a very uh, insightful window. I'm tempted to say psychological window uh, into uh, who these people really are, uh, and 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 what and and what their, uh, you know, what their emotional needs are. You're one of the things I love about talking to historians is the thirty thousand foot view that you take, the amount of research you do. Um, how do you feel historians are going to view this period in history? including, you know, your book, the reaction to it, you know, what you're seeing just on the political landscape. You know, take whatever time frame you want, but these things do go in cycles, and I'm curious where you see we are, and is, is there some way out of it? I think the challenge for future historians is to be nonpartisan, um, and the journalism isn't going to help them. Um, I very recently uh, and fairly seriously argued to one of my best friends who's, who's trying to decide, you know, what's, you know, their next book going to be, uh, that he should think about doing Trump um, because he is a nonpartisan person, um, really thorough. Um, he just has the personal strength uh, to be able to do Trump and not be either overwhelmingly hostile uh, or a fanboy. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we need. Um, academic history, you know, history in, in university history departments um, has really slipped in quality over the last 20 years, uh, both because of, of increased politicization and because too many historians are fixated on talking to other historians, not getting out there and, and you know, talking to real people who matter. Um, it's very striking to me that so many of the best books uh, that have been done in recent years, John Ives' new King biography that came yep. out three or four months ago, uh, Joshua Prager's great book on Norma McCorvey, the woman behind Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. um, John and Josh are former Wall Street Journal reporters. They put years into doing these books um, and they are exactly the sort of books we need. They're, they're not grinding anybody's partisan or political acts. They're books you that, you know, years from now, people will still look at. Do you feel that, I, I hate the cancel culture, I know has become a hackneyed term, but when applied to academia, that's certainly been a concern. Is that, you didn't mention that explicitly, but is that basically part of the same bucket, or do you think we we use that as an easy excuse for why we're not seeing the kind of work that you think we should be seeing more of. Um, my view of the problem is that it's is that academia has become too much of a fraternity uh, rather than a profession. Now, mm. most of my academic life I actually spent in law schools, uh, not history departments, even though I'm a historian. Uh, because of, of so much of my legal scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. And law schools, law faculties, always have been better at retaining a, a professional focus uh, rather than devolving into just a sort of friends and neighbors uh, a, approach to, to fraternization. Let me um, and off. I want to go back to the heart of the book. One thing that really is sort of coming back to the fore again is this, the, you know, the fact that you interviewed uh, Barack Obama's former girlfriend and, and, this, and the specifics of, of that sort of part of his origin story. Why was that so important and why do you think that still resonates right now? And talk a bit about it. Uh, forgive me, uh, Sheila. Um, Jagger, Jager. I hope I'm saying, yeah, Jagger, okay. Um, that really seems to hit a chord with people. And, and tell us a little well, bit about what, what happened there. One of the most striking things about Dreams from My Father, Barack's memoir, is the utter absence of women from the book. I mean, not mm -hmm. just the three 
future girlfriends, uh, but his mother too. Um, now, Who raised I mean, him. Any, <laughs> yes. Um, anyone doing a biography wants to identify and interview um, all the important people in, in your subject's life. Um, Alex McNear, Barack's first serious girlfriend, Genevieve Cook, uh, his second in New York in the mid 80s, and then Sheila Yeager, uh, with whom he lived for three years or so in Chicago. Um, so I went and uh, spent a day or more with Alex, um, actually went to Australia where Genevieve lives to spend several days with Genevieve. Um, Sheila had never been named before. Um, and again, we talked earlier about how incurious the journalism was. Mm -hmm. um, it was public that Barack, you know, had a girlfriend with whom he lived in Chicago, who was a grad student. Um, and no one had ever made the effort to, you know, go look at the student directory uh, to see who else was living at the same address as Barack Obama. Uh, that's how I found Sheila, um, my, my great uh, younger research assistant at, at Chicago. Uh, went to Regenstein Library and, you know, pulled these old, dusty student directories off the shelf. Um, we also found the very nice couple who lived right upstairs from them, uh, whom I talked to, too. Um, uh, you know, anyone, uh, I think, is going to have, uh, you know, multiple relationships when they're, you know, age 20 to age 30. Uh, there's nothing particularly unusual or remarkable about that. Uh, Sheila's story is is so important, so powerful, um, because she's living with him while he's doing the community work on the far south side. Uh, that's the first time Barack has been in a majority black cultural setting, you know, mm -hmm. before Chicago. Um, you know, he grew up in Hawaii. Most of his college friends were international students. Um, when he's in New York, uh, similarly, he's he's not living in a, a black context whatsoever. He's working for a you know, financial services firm, um, and so Sheila was was present uh, during this very formative period when Barack embraces uh, his black identity, um, and also when Barack is having his first thoughts uh, about a political career in the future. Um, yeah. that's why he to go to Harvard Law School in, in 1988. And she gives a very different interpretation of some of the key facts from his 1995 book. Let's just make that oh, clear. Yes. yes. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, composite girlfriend who appears in, in Dreams from My Father is perhaps maybe a third Alex, a third Genevieve, a third Sheila. I mean, they're, they're very different people. Um, but um, you know, you don't uh, you don't get to meet the real Barack Obama uh, reading dreams from my father. Um, as as I said back then, and it's a phrase that um, I can frankly say angered, still angers Barack. Uh, it's a work of historical fiction. Well, let me just say I want to just remind people why what it was that Sheila talks about that was so important because I, little bits and pieces are coming out even things like this letter that he wrote to her where he you know allegedly had thoughts about a gay relationship or wanting that that's now back in the press to your mind what is the heart of of why Sheila matters and why we should have been curious about her in terms of what uh, it says about Barack Obama I mean just just one small um, uh, timing point. Um, the, the, that letter in question is, is from November 1982. It's, it's to yep. Alex McNear. Um, oh, and, I'm and sorry. It's, it's, Forgive it's, me. Yeah. No, and yeah. It, it's, it's in the, you know, uh, archives at, at, Emory, at Emory University. Any, anybody can go and read that letter. They, they won't let you take a, a picture of it, um, but anyone can, can go and read that. That's, you know, public record. Um, no, Sheila, um, uh, you know, as I, I said just a moment ago, you know, Sheila was present, um, you know, when Barack is really adopting a, a black identity. And that mm -hmm. changes their relationship. Um, because she Sheila, is a white, a white girlfriend, for those who did not know. Well, I mean, this I, I, I guess this her is mixed, a, a mixed, uh, mixed uh, race, I suppose. Yes. She's got Japanese heritage as well. Yes. Yes. Um, she, you know, she, Sheila's uh, half Dutch, half Japanese. 
She does not identify as white. Um, and also, uh, she was Dutch uh, grandparents uh, were um, very much involved in protecting Jews during World War II. Um, and they're honored at Yad Vashem in, in Israel, um, the Heroes of the Holocaust uh, Memorial. Um, and one of the issues in, in Chicago politics at that time was black anti-Semitism. Um, mm -hmm. And again, this looms larger to David Samuels in our tablet interview than it does to me. Uh, tablet is, I think, focused yeah. towards the Jewish. Um, but Sheila was angry uh, that Barack did not share uh, her, the intensity of her feelings uh, about just how vile uh, black anti-Semitism was. Yeah. Well, if you, if I was to make you to, to sort of sum up here, guest, I'm going to make you guest editor of the media writ large. Um, you talk about this continued sense of partisanship, need for more curiosity. What should we be curious about now? Even the missive to future historians, what would you like to see people investigating more? Because if anything, there's an argument that we have been over covering, or certainly there's been a saturation coverage of both the Bidens and the Trumps, maybe not in the right area, arguably. So give us some assignments from where you sit, if you're not going to do it yourself. I think reestablishing uh, nonpartisan professionalism uh, in journalism is the number one need. Uh, we've seen two major newspapers, The Times and The Washington Post, uh, undergo dramatic qualitative decline over the past 15 years. I mean, and to me, as a liberal progressive, uh, The Times' obsession with Trump um, is, is hilarious but deeply damaging mm. um it, it's you know i i look at the you know front web page every day and it's just trump 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 um you know the 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 origins of this did happen during the obama years uh, because so much conservative media uh, got so caught up in in this uh, inveterate hostility uh, towards barack um, and I sensed very clearly um, during my three long conversations with him in 2016 uh, that the experience of the presidency, uh, the experience of all the hostility uh, directed towards him as president, um, had had the effect of, of making him feel blacker by mm -hmm. 2016 uh, than he had felt, say, in 2008. Um, uh, that the, seems the understandable media. to me, doesn't it? Oh, that yes. you're attacked yes. and, and you know, nothing like, you know, you bomb London, yeah. the people of London feel closer because there's an enemy. Yes. It solidifies your no. identity. No. But uh reestablishing professionalism uh in the news media is is my number one hope for the future. Well, and the consumers of media too, right? There's there's a this echo chamber where the way we consume news also seems to come through a, a partisan prism. Anything else that, that you'd want to add, uh, Dave, especially, you know, when the book came out in 2017, um, it was, you know, a lot of people thought this kind of book would be a blockbuster. It didn't perhaps do as well as some thought. Were you surprised by that? Or did it was it emblematic no. of what you're talking about? No, I wasn't surprised. It, it made the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, um, the got Washington, a review. Yeah, the, the Washington Post named it one of the you know ten best books of 2017. Um, but it came out you know four or five months into the Trump presidency. Um, yeah. Barack had disappeared, um, and everything was Trump, Trump, Trump. Um, yeah. It's uh, I mean, as we've seen this past two weeks. Uh, Rising Star, like Bearing the Cross, like Liberty and Sexuality, um, is a book that people will, you know, still be reading uh, 25 years from now. Um, and, and that, uh, as a historian, uh, is what you hope for. Great. Listen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, the book is, of course, Rising Star, and we're talking about the present day, you know, situation of how this is also played out. What's on your radar that you would put on ours as you're looking at the landscape now? You know, it's 
no dearth of information. Anything that's um, striking to you that you'd be paying attention to? Um, I follow the Supreme Court very closely. Um, and again, I, I try to look at it with a, you know, from a professional lens, not a political yeah. lens. Um, you know, and, and I'm and as a lefty progressive, I'm happy to say that, you know, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, they are good justices. This is a really serious court. Um, you know, a more serious court in terms of, of the analytical quality of their work uh, than what we had during the 1960s or 1970s. Um, to me, I mean, the court is very important to me. Uh, I think the court is very important to us, um, and it's imperative to keep the court as as uh, distant from from uh, partisan politics as as is possible. Great. Thank you again, David, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Diane.